بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد Welcome to another episode of The Sunnah, The Better. And I'm your host and your brother, Abu Usama Al-Dhahabi. Nurahibu bikum jami'a. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we're going to talk about the Sunnah and what the Sunnah had to say and has to say about the companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. And many people from this nation, from this ummah, from the practicing Muslims, they don't really give the companions their due respect and the position that they have and all occupy in this deen. And that's because many of us see the companions as being a group of personalities that made sacrifices in Al-Islam and they have some nice stories connected to them, but the companions are more than that. And they deserve that we understand this. The companions in actuality, Ikhwani, are an institution in Al-Islam. The companions are a symbol of the religion of Al-Islam, an institution or a symbol something that Allah Ta'ala mentioned in a number of ayat of the Qur'an. In Arabic, it's called the Sha'ira, and the plural is Sha'air. Allah mentioned, for an example, ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَذَّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ إِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَ الْقُلُوبِ Whoever exalts and he reverences and he makes the symbols of Allah, he makes them high and exalted, this is a sign and an example of the taqwa that's in that individual's heart. He mentioned in the Quran, Inna Safa Wal Marwata min Sha'irin Lah. Verily, the mountain of Safa and the mountain of Marwa, the two mountains in Mecca at the Kaaba, they're from the institutions and from the symbols of Allah, the symbols of Al Islam. And as a result of that, the people look at them a certain way. It's like the Kaaba is an institution or a symbol. If you were to meet a Muslim who went to perform the Hajj for the first time and you were to ask him, how did it feel when you first saw the Kaaba? How did it feel? Many of them are going to respond by saying, it's impossible for me to explain how I felt. I was discombobulated. I lost my equilibrium. I didn't even know where I was at. It felt like the ground and the earth below my feet was moving. And that's because in the mind of the Muslim, in the heart of the Muslim, he sees the Kaaba in pictures and photos. He sees the Kaaba in the programs that are presented on Islam channel and other than that. And he forms an image in his mind about the Kaaba. But when he finally gets there, he's overcome and he's overtaken with these overwhelming feelings of being in a place that is unlike any other place because the Kaaba is an institution, a symbol of the deen. Just as we look at the Kaaba, wallahi thumma billahi, the companions are even more than that. The Kaaba is the bait of Allah Azza wa Jal, the house of Allah. As every single house, a masjid is a house of Allah. But the Kaaba is the premier house of Allah Azza wa Jal. The companions are greater than that. Because the normal average Muslim, the normal average Muslim, his sanctity with Allah is greater than the Kaaba. And the Kaaba's sanctity based upon the authentic athar that happened when Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu was sitting and he was marveling at the glorious nature of the Kaaba. And he said to the Kaaba, Ma a'adham hurmatik wa inna hurmat al-mu'min a'adham indallah. How great you are and how sacred and sanctified you are, O Kaaba. But the sanctity of the believer, of the Muslim, is greater than you. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for the whole dunya to dissipate and disappear. Litazul ad dunya for one believer to be killed unjustly. This is a great thing. He said, for the whole dunya to disappear, to go away, that is lighter and lesser in degree and in the scales than for one Muslim to lose his life unjustly. So the Kaab is part of the dunya. So the companions, radiallahu anhum, they are more than just nice personalities, illustrious personalities, men of nobility, 
who made some efforts and therefore we love them. No, we have to understand that our religion and our Islam, it has to be patterned after the Islam of the companions. The understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah that each and every Muslim has, it has to be the same and exact understanding that the companions have. And if a Muslim feels liberal to detract himself or to divorce himself from the understanding of the companions as it relates to the Quran and the Sunnah, then that individual is on an Islam that won't be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every Muslim is going to say that he takes the Quran and the Sunnah. And no doubt, the Quran and the Sunnah, they guide to the Sirat al Mustaqim. No doubt about that. The jinn in Surat al Ahqaf, after hearing the message of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they went back to their brethren from the jinn and they said to them, Ya qawmana, inna sami'na kitaban unzila min ba'di Musa, musaddiqan lima bayni yadayhi, yahdi ila al haqq. They said, oh, our people from the jinn, we have heard a recitation, a book that was revealed after Musa, confirming what went before it, the Torah and the Injil, the, the, the Torah of Musa. This Quran that we heard, this recitation, confirms what went before it. It guides to the haq, to the tariq mustaqim. So this ayat establishes that the Quran guides to the sarat mustaqim. No doubt about that. But if you were to give the Quran to an individual without the Sunnah, he's not going to be able to practice practically the Sarat al Mustaqim because the Sunnah is what was given to explain the Quran. So the Quran guides to the Sarat al Mustaqim and the Sunnah explains the Sarat al Mustaqim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Innaka la tahdi ila Sarat al Mustaqim. Verily you, Muhammad, you guide to the Sirat al-Mustaqim. So the Quran guides to the Sirat al-Mustaqim. But without the Sunnah, you can't know what the Quran is saying. And the Sunnah guides to the Sirat al-Mustaqim, as this ayat in Surah al-Shura clearly demonstrates. Now the issue is, were you and I present to meet the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so as to take his Sunnah, to know the Sirat al-Mustaqim from the Quran or from the Sunnah? No. That's where the companions come in at. That's where the companions and their importance come in at as it relates to us being Muslims and practicing this religion. And it's no wonder from the wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal that the greatest surah of the Quran is Surah Al-Fatiha. And Allah Ta'ala has commanded us to read Surah Al-Fatiha in all of our five prayers in each and every rak'ah. And in Surah Al-Fatiha is the dua and the request of the believers, Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqim, Sirat al-Ladheena an'amta alayhim. We ask Allah to guide us to the Sirat that is Mustaqim, that Quran and that Sunnah. So we're asking Allah, guide us to the Sirat al-Mustaqim, the Sirat of those people who you put your favors upon. You shower them and bless them with your ni'mah, your favors. If you were to go to the books of Tafsir, the book of Al-Imam Ibn Kathir and other than Al-Imam Ibn Kathir from the Mufassirin, Rahimahumullah Ta'ala, they said that one of the meanings of the Sirat al-Mustaqeen that the believers ask Allah to guide them to is guide us to the way of Abu Bakr and Umar and the rest of the companions, radiyallahu anhum. Because they are the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed his ni'mah upon. As he mentioned in another ayat of the Quran in Surat An-Nisa, وَمَنْ يُتِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَا الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, then they will be with those who Allah showered his favor upon them, gave them their ni'mah from the nabiyyin at the top of them, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the as siddiqeen on the top of them, Abu Bakr as Siddiq, radiallahu anhu. And the Shuhada, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and the rest of those companions who received the Shahada fi sabilillah was Salihin, and the rest of the righteous members of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So the point here is that as Muslims, we need to understand that it is much more to a Muslim 
as it relates to the companions, to look at them as being a symbol of this religion, as opposed to just, oh, they were some nice individuals who were blessed to have been in the presence of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So the companions occupy a tremendous position in the religion of Al-Islam. And no matter who comes after them, no matter how virtuous that individual is who came after the companions, he will never be able to occupy the same place that the companion of Al-Islam occupied as a result of and on the strength of him being chosen to be a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam. The Messenger of Allah told everybody, لا تسبوا أصحابي فوالذي نفسي بيده لو أن أحدكم أن he said, do not curse anyone from my companions because I swear by Allah, I swear by the one who my soul is in his hands. If one of you people were to spend the size of Mount Uhud in gold, it would never equal the mud that one of my companions spent, nor would it ever equal half of a mud. And a mud is a form of measurement during that time. It's when a normal-sized man, he takes four hand scoops of raisins, salt, prunes, whatever it happens to be, to take four handfuls of dates or whatever, four handful equals a mud. So if you were to take the size of Mount Uhud and you were to spend all of that in gold, it wouldn't equal Half of a mud of one, what the companions sacrificed in the religion of Al-Islam. Allahu Akbar. That goes to show. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, Al-Imam Malik, Al-Imam Shafi, Al-Imam Ahmed, Rahimahumullahu Ta'ala. No matter who. Never would he be able to occupy the position of a single one of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are a symbol of this religion and an institution in this deen. And they are more than just some illustrious personalities. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in bringing this point home in his sunnah, he said about them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and najum amanatun nissama. فَإِذَا ذَهَبَتَ النَّجُومُ أَتَى السَّمَاءِ مَا تُوعَدْ وَأَنَا أَمَنَةٌ لِأَصْحَابِي فَإِذَا ذَهَبْتُ أَتَى أَصْحَابِي مَا يُعَدُونَ وَأَصْحَابِي أَمَنَةٌ لِأُمَّتِي فَإِذَا ذَهَبَ أَصْحَابِي أَتَى أُمَّتِي مَا يُعَدُونَ He said that the stars in the skies are protectors for the sky. The stars, the najum that are in the sky, they will protect the sky. If those stars were to leave and they were to go, then what the sky was promised is going to happen, meaning Yom al Qiyamah. The infitar and the inshiqaq of the earth and the sky, renting the sunday and all of that, as long as those stars are in the sky, that's not going to happen. But when those stars leave, that's when Yom al Qiyamah is going to be established and what was promised is going to happen to the sky. So the stars protect the, st the skies. And then he went on to say that I, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I am the protector of my companions. So if I go, if I were to die, then what my companions were promised is going to happen to them. Where they were going to have differences amongst themselves and there were going to be a few fitnas before, between some of them. He said, and my companions are the protectors of my ummah. If my companions go, when they go, then what my ummah has been promised is going to happen. So it goes to show, ikhwani, that the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they are an institution in the religion of al-Islam. They are a symbol of the religion of al-Islam. He told us sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, سَتَفْتَرِقُ هَذِي الْأُمَّةِ عَلَى الثَّلَاثُ وَالسَّبَعِينَ فِرْقَةً كُلُّهَا فِي النَّارِ إِلَّا وَاحِدًا قِيلَ وَمَا الْوَاحِدَةُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ قَالْ التي أنا عليه اليوم أصحابي أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم. This ummah is going to split up into 73 different groups and sects. All of them will be astray. All of them will be in the hellfire except one. They said, which one is going to be the accepted one? Which one is going to be the saved sect? 
Which one is going to be upon that which is pleasing to Allah and his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, the one that is doing what I'm doing today and my companions. He could have just said, like we mentioned earlier, the one who's just following the sunnah. He could have said that, the one who's following the Quran and the sunnah. Just that, a general statement. But he said, the sect or the group of people were doing what I'm doing today, the religion that I'm upon today and my companions. And that's why he told us, Ikhwani, in the authentic statements that have been attributed to him concerning the issue of the importance of not innovating in the deen. Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fahuwa radd. Anyone who introduces in this affair of ours, this deen, that which is not from it, it will be rejected. The things that the companions didn't know about, it can't be the religion today, as Al-Imam Malik used to say. What was the religion for them back then is the religion for us today. What is not the religion for them back then, it cannot and should not be the religion for us today. So if we don't find the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa celebrating the birthday of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then we, by all means, should avoid it because they are a symbol. They are greater than just being a group of illustrious personalities. Their understanding of this religion is the religion of Al-Islam. And we have to connect ourselves to that understanding and then we'll be successful and we'll be saved. The companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam have been mentioned in a number of ayat of the Quran that show their virtues. Like the statement, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he said in the Quran, Muhammad al-Rasulullah, وَالَّذِينَ مَعْهُ شِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارِ رُحَمَاءُ بَيْنَهُمْ تَرَاهُمْ رُكَّعٍ سُجَّةً يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ سِيْمَاهُمْ فِي وَجُّوهِهِمْ مِنْ أَثْرِ السُّجُودِ ذَلِكَ مَثْلُهُمْ فِي الْتَوْرَاتِ وَمَثْلُهُمْ فِي الْإِنْجِيلِ فَآزَرَهُ فَاسْتَغْلَذَ فَاسْتَوَى عَلَى سُوقِهِ يُعْجِبُ الزُّرَّاءِ لِيَغِيذَ بِيهُمُ الْكُفَّارِ وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ مِنْهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرٍ عَظِيمًا In the end of Surah Al-Fatih, the last ayat in Surah Al-Fatih, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, صلى الله عليه وسلم. And those people who are with him, رضي الله عنهم, they are strong against the non-Muslims, and they are soft and compassionate towards the believers. They seek to gain the pleasure of Allah. They make sajda and all of that, make jihad. They do all of the good deeds to seek the pleasure of Allah. That is, you will see their marks within their faces. That could be their prayer marks. It could be the light on their faces that comes as a result of a tawheed. You will see the effects of this in their faces as a result of their many sajdas. That is their similar tool in the Torah. And their similar tool in the Injil is like a seed that sends forth its blade. And from that blade, it sends forth its stalk. And the stalk becomes very, very powerful and strong. And it becomes alluring and pleasing to the ones who sold that seed. So that Allah with them could strike fear into the hearts of the disbelievers. Allah has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds from amongst them that he will forgive them and that they will get a tremendous reward. This ayat of the Quran is an ayat that is azimah. Wallahi, the qadr of this ayat is azimah. First of all, it goes to show the virtues of the companions in that they were mentioned in the Torah and the Injil. Allah told those people who Musa went to and the people that Isa went to, salawatullah wa salamu alayhima, he told them about Rasulullah and his companions in the Injil. Then Allah tell the people of Ahlul Kitab and their two divinely revealed books, the Torah and the Injil, did he tell them about you and me as people? No, he told them about Muhammad and his messenger and his companions, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. The ayat also goes to show that we have to believe in the qadr. The qadr is Allah knows what's going to happen before it happens because he sent this ayat describing the companions in the Torah and the Injil before the companions were even created. And the people of Ahlul Kitab knew about them, heard about them, had an idea about Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and Ukash and Zayd ibn Thabit and the rest of them, radi Allah anhum. So those people who say Allah doesn't know what's going to happen until it happens, they have committed a grievous crime in Al-Islam.
The ayat also goes to show Ikhwani that the companions have been forgiven for all of what they've done. And Allah has prepared for them a tremendous reward in his Jannah. Another ayat. In Surah At-Tawbah, ayat number 100, Allah Ta'ala described and he said about them, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن وأعد لهم جنات تجري تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها أبدا ذلك الفوز العظيم The vanguard of Al-Islam, the Sabiqun, the first vanguard of Al-Islam from the Muhajireen and the Ansar, the people of Mecca and Medina He said about them, Tabarak wa Ta'ala and those who follow them in Ihsan anyone who follows their way you have to follow their way if you follow their way, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for them forgiveness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them and they will be pleased with Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for them gardens under which rivers flow. And they will remain there forever. And that is the true great felicity. So that's another example of the Quran. And there are so many ayat that show the virtues of the companions of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they show the virtues following them. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا Anyone who opposes the messenger, after the knowledge has come to him and the guidance has come to him and he, and he wants to oppose the messenger, and follow other than the way of the believers, radiallahu anhum, then we have prepared for him a grievous punishment, and his resting place will be the hellfire and what an evil abode. Now, something we should make mention of in this ayat, that the ayat mentioned opposing Allah's Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and opposing the way of his companions. It could have just said opposing the messenger of Allah, because opposing the Quran by itself is a problem. The Quran guides to the Surat al-Mustaqeem. Opposing the Prophet and his Sunnah by itself is enough. The Sunnah guides to the Surat al-Mustaqeem, as we've mentioned already. So Allah could have just mentioned whoever opposes the Messenger, as he mentioned in another ayat of the Quran. In al-ladhina kafaru wa saddu an sabilillah wa shaqu al-rasul min ba'di ma tabayyana lahum al-huda lan yaduru laha shay'a wa sayuhbitu a'maluhum. Anyone who opposes them, those who disbelieve and they close off the ways of Allah and they oppose the messenger after the guidance came to him. And only messenger was mentioned in this ayah. Whoever opposes him after the guidance came to him, they won't harm Allah one bit and Allah will render their deeds null and void. But in the other ayah, they oppose the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they oppose the sabil and the way of the companions, the believers, then he will be forced to go into a wretched Terrible punishment. So it goes to show, brothers and sisters in Al Islam, if you were doing something, believing in something, practicing something that wasn't believed in, it wasn't understood, it wasn't practiced by the companions, then you should avoid it because if it wasn't the religion for them, it shouldn't and it can't be the religion for us here today. What the Prophet brought to them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is the deen. And what he didn't bring to them is not the deen. And what they didn't practice is not the deen. And that's why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and radiallahu anhu, he told the people in advising them, Follow tenaciously. Follow the companions. And don't innovate. Don't introduce new things in the religion because what they brought to you is enough for you. And then in another authentic statement of Abdullah, Ibn Mas'ud, he told the people, radiallahu anhum, you should follow the way of that which is ancient, the atiq, the religion that is ancient, meaning the original religion that the Prophet brought. And he's the one who told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِيشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالسُنَّةِ وَالسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِ عَدُّ عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِدِ Verily those who live for a long time, you're going to see a lot of ikhtilaf. So therefore when you see the many different, the opinions and the different things that are people saying, then take my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa al-rashideen. Hold on to it with your molas and Allah knows best 
والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته